So today we're going to do formative feedback, and this is assessment for learning. Um, they're the opposite, which is assessment of learning, will be next week um, when we talk about summative feedback, but this week it's assessment for learning, which is formative feedback. Um, this is part of the preceptor series, and so here are the CE disclosures and the information about the, the um, CE. And it is the same process that you have done before, um, and that is also written out in, the, in one of the la la later slides. So take a look at that. So first of all, what is formative feedback? Formative feedback basically is this information that you communicate back to the learner so they can modify their behavior and improve their learning. And I really like this feedback cycle that was put out. This is not shoots. Um, I, I, I do not have an attribution for, for this cycle, um, but basically the very first thing is, is there's this discovery. Um, whether it's a self-discovery or you as the preceptor kind of assist in that discovery. Um, and I'll call those insights later so that they get some insights about their behavior. Then you look at the causes and consequences. And sometimes when we hear causes and consequences, we, we think of the negative, something bad happened, there was a poor outcome. But this can also be causes and consequences of a positive outcome. And we have to keep that in mind. Then we look for options, we commit to an action or we help the student find an action. And then we, we start the process all over again by evaluating and discovering. So we're gonna talk all about that process today. So there are some basic characteristics of what formative feedback looks like. One of the most important things I think that, that while I was putting this together, I discovered was that this is a mutually agreed upon kind of predetermined process with the student or the person that you're orienting or your peer, you make an agreement about how you're going to give them feedback. Sometimes it's at the end of the day during that, that debrief. Um, sometimes it can be more informal and you can just say, hey, you know, is it okay if I give you feedback and, and talk about giving mutual feedback and, and some of those uh, our other characteristics of formative feedback, that mutuality, the giving and receiving. Um, make sure that your feedback, formative feedback is timely. Don't wait too long to give feedback because you're separated from the event too far and don't remember the objective details that you wanna to communicate to the person. It's ongoing and frequent. And so this is something that you don't always have to plan. Um, it can be walking down the hallway and giving somebody some feedback. You want to make sure that you're very supportive in your words, your tone, your posturing towards, um, in this case, the student, because since we're talking about precepting, you want to make sure you're focused and brief. Anything too complicated and long, you're going to lose your message. And then I put this ratio in here, um, two to one. So um, this is not the sandwich method, which I'll talk about in a minute, but this is making sure that when you give feedback to a peer or a, a student, you wanna make sure that you give more positives than you give negatives. Because if you're always giving a negative message, people get a little bit leery about hearing your message or don't really want feedback. And then um, just a, a note about this sandwich method. Um, there was a period of time when we were told to make sure that when you were giving feedback to somebody that you gave a positive message, then you gave the here's what you need to improve message, and then you ended up with a positive message. And what we found out is, is that people got really keyed when the, you gave them a positive message because they were waiting for the other shoe to drop. They were waiting for you to say something negative. And so to kind of start avoiding that um, conditioning that happened with that, uh, making sure that you give a piece of feedback that isn't sandwiched together. Um, and you can say, hey, I wanna give you some advice today about what happened, or would you be willing to hear some advice today um, about what happened? Could be the start of a negative and the beginning of a positive. You know, I noticed you did something really well today and I wanted to let you know about that. Um, so that ratio is really important. So, so again, we don't get expectant of negative feedback. Engaging the student in a self-assessment as you're beginning that formative feedback is really useful. That way they can gain their own insights. That's the realized insight. Or you can prompt them towards insights about their behavior. Another really important item is to be psychologically safe when you're giving 
um, feedback, and that means being neutral, it means being non judgmental. Also, be willing to receive feedback. If you're giving the student feedback, be willing to receive back feedback. And actually, asking them for feedback is a good way to prompt them to that. And they can start um, practicing that mutual um, respect um, and thinking mutually and collaboratively about how do we improve processes all around, giving and receiving feedback. Timing is another really important thing. Um, and, and I used to do this all the time. This very first one is disrupting learning. We'd be doing a, a process or they'd be in the middle of thinking about something and I would give them feedback and that would disrupt their whole process. And Barb kind of talked about that um, a week or two ago um, when she talked about Benner and the novice learner only being able to concentrate on what they're doing. And that's absolutely what I was doing. I was, I was interrupting their process. Um, so don't disrupt their learning. Be brief um, and, or, or I'm sorry, during the brief, I, I did brief and debrief. So um, brief or, or that huddle in the morning, kind of let the students set their objectives for the day or you help them set their objectives. And then during the debrief is a time when you can give that feedback. For all of you that are on the line, I see Cheryl joined us. Um, is there any other kind of characteristics of formative feedback that you can think of? Um, when you give formative feedback, things that you remember to do. Uh, this is Mary. Okay. Um, I I viewed this um, session on the cues and teaching strategies, and it's done by Jerry Altmiller. So I want to give her credit, but she really frames it with uh, a statement of, you know, I really um, care about you as your mentor. Or your teacher and I really want to be I really want you to be the best you can be so I'm giving you this feedback so that you can reflect on it and then you know um, have a plan in place for how you can do it differently in the future so it seemed like when she frames it in that I care about you and I want you to be mm -hmm. better seems to be a nice um, strategy for giving formative feedback right and we're going to talk about um, framing and giving that feedback um, in just a minute before we do that, though, I want to kind of have you consider the context of giving feedback. And number one is um, the person who will always be there, which is the learner. And so you want to think about what are their baseline skills? Where are they starting with their skills, their knowledge, and their professional behaviors? Now, in general, the students that you'll receive at Neighborhood Family Practice are senior students but there will be instances where you maybe have students who are younger in their nursing um, education you want to think about what their daily goals were setting them in that brief or that huddle in the morning and what are their overall course objectives you also want to think about what their preferences are remember i told you to kind of predetermine the process ask them what their preferences are for receiving feedback and help them think about what is most comfortable for them and how receptive um, how, how they can get um, feedback so that they're most receptive to that feedback. And that really is an important point for the learner. How receptive are they? If we give them too much feedback at one time or we give negative feedback, then they get a, bit, a little bit leery about getting that feedback as I talked about before. And then you as the, the preceptor, what are the daily clinic objectives you have? What are you doing in clinic today that has to be accomplished? What are those learning objectives and course objectives you also have to kind of think about too? Then what is your professional assessment related to all of those things, including the clinic culture? What's your comfort and confidence level related to giving feedback? Because sometimes you can get tentative um, and you're trying to choose the right words and then maybe it comes off as inauthentic. And you really wanna be authentic when you give, give feedback. Um, you wanna acknowledge the learner's emotional response if they have any, or you can say, how are you feeling about the feedback I gave you today? Kind of as a, as a closure um, to, to the session. And then one of the things, and Mary just talked about at Altmiller um, and her work, but giving, giving feedback is a preceptor responsibility. And I don't say that to say, hey, you've gotta give feedback but to say sharing this information with the student is an important thing. This is my responsibility. I want to help you to be the best nurse you can be, just like Mary said. Um, this sometimes will prevent some pushback, um, some incivility, some 
negative emotional responses and open up the student to say, yeah, that is my preceptor's responsibility. It also will be my responsibility too someday. Any other thoughts about context? Um, the only thing I can think of, and we talked about this before, I, I do feel like it's important when giving feedback that we give the background behind it. Yes. This is why. Um, yes. I feel like that part of the conversation is really important. Yes. The, the why to the, the conversation, that, that would be um, part of the guidelines here. So um, to, to set that up, thank you for introducing the guidelines section, Tanya. <laughs> to set that up, you want to meet in a quiet and comfortable space. Now, when I say that, people think about this formal formative feedback. I've got a debrief. We're going to meet in a quiet, comfortable space. I'm going to talk to you. There's also the more informal. You just want to make sure that it's a space where you can both be heard and uninterrupted. Maybe you're walking to the parking lot to do a drive up clinic. Maybe you're walking down the hallway to deliver a specimen someplace. And you want to just say to the student, you know, how do you think that conversation went with the patient we just saw? And you can give them formative feedback as you're walking down the hall. It does not have to be in depth, um, especially if it's a positive thing. There's not a lot of processing that goes with it. Um, in the um, end parts for action steps, which we'll get to in just a minute. So that just walking down the hall works also. You want to introduce the feedback topic, and that's exact, exactly what Tanya was just talking about. What is the topic we're talking about? What's the background? What do we want to discuss today? And then you want to ask the student to tell you about their achievements or deficits related to whatever you introduced. That's that discovery, that self-discovery, talking through. You're gonna to wanna to use some prompting questions, including what did you think about that? Were there things that you could have done differently? And as Mary said earlier, you wanna say, I really want to help you with this. So I wanna prompt you and, and I'm gonna think about some things that you could do better too. But you wanna to listen to the student as they're giving you that information to see whether they're in a learning orientation or if they're in a task orientation. And what I mean by that is, is that are they trying to learn from what's going on? Or are they so focused on the task that they were trying to accomplish that they can't see the bigger picture of learning? So listening for that will help you offer your observations to the students and their accomplishments or those, those deficits. And note, um, first of all, how your observations are re received. And then during this period of time, you can confirm can foster that learning orientation. What could you do differently the next time is a learning orientation question. Um, how might that have affected the, the patient or the person you were talking to? And what could you do to make that different the next time you do that? You wanna, you wanna ask those learning orientation questions. You might be able to end the conversation there. How are you feeling about the feedback I gave you today? Um, and you can kind of close, close the feedback back loop at that point in time. Other times there will, there will be a performance gap. And so that's what I mean by find the gap. If there is a gap, then you discuss it and you, degre you agree mutually on what that deficit is so that you can move forward with this asking the student what they could do to correct the deficit. So in, in before you jump in, because we, we have in our mind what could be different and how they could do it different, you want to ask the student to process that. Again, that's part of that learning orientation. And you want to support that student as they generate those options um, for that learning orientation and then select that course of action. Then you want to ask the, the student to reflect on that plan and set a time for follow up um, if you were asking them to change a behavior. Are there any other things in that process that you guys have done differently before? Or you can say, boy, this really worked well for me when I was giving feedback. I can't think of anything. Okay, okay. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So what are the outcomes? Well, we're, we're looking for outcomes that um, are positive um, whenever we do anything, and that in, that's inclusive of formative feedback. So when you give feedback and engage a student in feedback, you can increase their confidence level because they, they know what they have done well. 
um, and you have informed them of what they have done well. They know that they're on the right track, which is that next one, which is they're reducing on, you're reducing their uncertainty. Some students are anxious or unsure and clinical because they don't know if they're doing it right um, or if they've taken the right path. And so you can help them out by giving them feedback to guide them along the way. And then I talked about filling the gap, whether it's a professional behavior, skills, or knowledge. You want to always kind of be alert to those things that you can give them feedback about. You know, I, I read this article about hypertension that really might be helpful for you to read before you come to clinical the next time as a way to introduce a conversation about their knowledge deficit about hypertension. Um, then you also can help them build skills related to self-assessment, especially when you ask them to do two things. One is, how did you think things went today? They're assessing themselves. And then, how do you think you can change this is, always a, is also a self-assessment piece in that it asks the student to ask themselves, how can I do this better the next time? What am I comfortable with doing? And the big part about this formative feedback is that that normalizes the feedback process. And when you normalize a process, people will do it automatically. You'll hear people giving um, each other feedback about how a drive it up clinic went, um, how some process went, and you're automatically then building in this feedback loop that helps improve processes in the clinic to have improved uh, outcomes for your patients. You also increase the confidence level of the student and you build a trusting relationship with them because they know you're going to tell them if they've done something that isn't quite where they need to be and you'll tell them what they're doing right so they can continue those behaviors. Anybody else seen anything that helps them say, boy, formative feedback is really useful because of this outcome? Becky, this is Barb. Hi, Barb. One of the um, things that I like to do with formative feedback is kind of use an analysis of a map with a learner where they going, going back to what you said earlier about setting objectives. So if that's where we're going, then the formative feedback becomes you take the right road, not the left road to get there. And so sometimes it takes the personal um, emotion out of it. Mm -hmm. and just helps guide them to where they've already said they want to go. And that's really easy with a learner who's in college and paying for this because right. they do have that goal. They have a mm -hmm. big career goal and we can break that down. So sometimes mm -hmm. just using that analogy helps, um, helps them place that and makes it normative because everybody knows what a map is. Everybody uses that map. Right. And so sometimes it just helps that way. Yeah, great. Thanks, Barb. I think another important oh, outcome, sorry. That's a, I think another important outcome is quality. Mm -hmm. um, and that right. I don't think as nurses, like we've learned this skill well, you know, in prior, uh, prior um, nurses who've gone through school, like we've never mm -hmm. really set this up as a really important component of quality. And that, you know, it is important to <clears throat> give feedback to our peers to ensure that, you know, the care we deliver as a unit or as a clinic is, you know, high quality. So I think. Right, right. And safety, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the more we give each other feedback, the more normal it becomes or the, and, and normal might be the wrong word there, but the more natural it, it becomes. You just start doing it. You have agreed upon this process and you continue to do it, whether it's your peers, your colleagues, um, you, you, Think of you know that split between providers and nurses or um, the clerical staff. Um, it's very easy sometimes to do it within your peer group, or easier to do it within your peer group. But then when you move um, to different um, professions or team members, it gets a little more uncomfortable. But the more we normalize it, the more comfortable it becomes. Okay. Any other thoughts before we move on? Okay. So what are some of the challenges? So one of them is that timing I talked about. Um, I, I did talk about make sure you don't interrupt a procedure, um, but I wanted to kind of bring that out and make sure I, I drove that home because it does become a safety risk as well as disrupt that learning. Um, 
the other thing is, is that sometimes you have to think about where the student is at and choose a different time. If the student looks anxious or says they can't hear anything or looks upset, they probably cannot receive feedback at that time. And that might be a time to kind of close the session down and say, you know what, I see that you're upset. Let's talk about that. We can talk about what I wanted to give you feedback about at a different time. We'll, we'll set that up. But right now, let's talk about what's going on with you. So you change your own path. You, you went in thinking you were give them some feedback. Timing is not right. They're not going to receive you well. Um, so you can make a choice to kind of change, change your own path um, during that time. The other thing is safety. If you are in a situation where the learner is violating some safety practice, you have to be calm and be directive. This is not a time for formative feedback. Um, one of the um, models that can be used or methods that can be used to stop that student is to start with I'm concerned statements or using the cuss method from team steps. You say, I'm concerned um, about the way you're thinking about that. And that kind of makes the student step back to think about what they're doing. If they don't, you can say, I'm really uncomfortable with what you're doing. If they still keep going, you can say, this is a safety issue, stop. Um, so using that method sometimes helps, but certainly if it's a safety issue, you have to be really directive. It's not time to ask the student, hey, how do you think you're doing here? Um, you have to intervene for the safety of either the staff or the patient, as well as the student, because they want psychologically sa psychological safety in the end. And if you don't stop them, there will be repercussions for them in the future and in their career if they've made an error. Um, so that really does become an important piece. Um, and then, then again, you can discuss that in a safe space later. So those are the challenges. Oh, I should, I actually should ask, have anybody else um, met with other challenges with giving formative feedback? The only other thing I can think of is, um, obviously, if it's safety, that's different. But mm -hmm. if we're actually with a patient, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to give feedback in front of the patient. Um, right. We will be waiting until we are away. And just like you said, then talk about what happened and could mm -hmm. we have maybe done that a little differently. Um, mm -hmm. I, I definitely would avoid giving feedback in front of somebody else. Right, right. Now, um, that's negative feedback. Sometimes um, positive feedback um, in front of the, the, the patient um, can be useful and can bolster the confidence of the patient in the student as well as the student's co um, confidence. Um, but definitely anything that's a safety issue, you're absolutely right. You want to talk about that privately. This is a time where you want to make sure you're, you're totally private. This is not a hallway conversation when it's been a safety concern. Right. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. I also had a student who oh. was really like non-receptive mm -hmm. of the feedback. <clears throat> and I finally just said, you know, what's, what, what is it about feedback that concerns you? And then they, she disclosed that it was that whenever she gets feedback, she sees it as criticism. And, oh. and that's how she's been raised. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really hard for her to change that perception. Right. And that is one of the major issues for people being non-receptive or unreceptive to feedback is the fact that they have this idea that it is criticism. Um, and so that might be one of the conversations you have as you're setting up this mutually agreeable process um, to give feedback to one another and say, you know what? Yes, we, I understand that you can hear it as criticism. Sometimes I do too. Um, but let's just agree that this is not criticism. This is, this is to help us improve or modify our behaviors for best outcomes for ourselves and for our patients. Great, thanks. Okay, then there's constructive criticism. Now, it's, it is a form of formative feedback. Um, but we hear people say, well, I'm going to give you some constructive criticism. So one of the things you, you might want to think of is, first of all, calling it constructive feedback or practical advice. Um, but this is very much a, a little shift from formative feedback in that is very outcomes focused. 
you want to definitely make a change in that behavior. Not thinking about changing their behavior um, and um, kind of um, being self-reflective, but this is a little more guiding than formative feedback. Um, it does have many of the characteristics, the challenges um, of formative feedback, but the major differences is our, this is periodic. This doesn't happen all the time. Um, and it happens when there has to be a behavior change for somebody. It's very evaluative. Um, this behavior is not working and this is the outcome when you continue this behavior. One of the easy ones to talk about is people coming in late, um, not being on time. And you can say, you know what? Your behavior of coming in late causes this to happen in the clinic. This is what I need you to change. You must be five minutes early um, when you come in um, so that we can get our day started with the huddle. Um, there may be some remediation that is um, connected to that. Now, coming in late, probably there's not a lot of remedi remediation, but if it's a knowledge deficit, you might suggest some reading or a video um, or uh, a pr a, them putting a small presentation together for the staff so that they can learn by doing and putting together a presentation. Um, but sometimes there's some remediation uh, attached to that. The extra challenges here are that when people hear this, they definitely hear when you get more directive that, the, that it is a criticism. So that sensitivity level goes up. Um, you want to make sure that you frame this so that it's very encouraging. Um, and that can be an extra challenge for the person giving the um, constructive feedback. And the support is, is kind of the same thing, is because they are hearing this so much as criticism, you wanna kind of bolster them up and say, you know what, I know you can change this behavior. This is totally doable. Um, let's make a plan for doing that. Any thoughts about constructive criticism? This is part of my daily lifestyle as a staff and timing and things like that, that you're talking about i have to do mm -hmm. this on a regular basis so this is interesting yeah yeah um and sometimes th there is some processing going on and said to what is behind the behavior and we're going to talk a little bit about that in um helping with behavior changes in just a minute so th that's constructive criticism then there's some barriers to change um and this this is one of the, the things that I wanna talk about um, because when you get to that fill in the gap, you say, well, why don't people change their behavior, especially when it's a repetitive behavior? So I found this nice little stair step. Um, and so if you can identify where your student or your um, peer or your um, staff are on this stair step, it, it can absolutely help direct you and how encouraging, supportive, and kind of what your role is in the whole thing. So if somebody's saying, hey, I didn't even know I had a problem, that's where you, you start by helping them gain some insight. If you get them clear up to understand, oh, I see what you're talking about, they can start being more reflective on their own. It takes a little bit more work at those lower steps, though, for you to move them um, towards what changes need to be made. Then when we're talking about making changes, sometimes people can't kind of get to the change. So I'm wondering um, of the people on the call, how many of you use motivational interviewing in your work with patients? Definitely, I do. Yeah. I do. You have okay. to be positive with them as you're coming at, at it negatively, they're not gonna hear you, they're gonna shut down. That's important, right. yes, I agree. Okay. So it's, it sounds like you guys use motivational interviewing. So think about modifying motivational interviewing from use with patients to use with your preceptees, your, your students or your learners that are coming in. You want to really motivate them towards a change. It's very outcome focused when you're talking about motivational interviewing and it helps you overcome those barriers um, that you can have with students. So there are some basics in motivational interviewing, which I'm sure that you all know and we are running out of time. So I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but this motivational interviewing or using these motivational interviewing practices can absolutely move the students from, I can't do that, I don't want to do that, I don't understand why you're asking me to do that, to some action steps. 
So I just want to think you to think about transferring that information or that that model you already use and use it in a little different way with your students. Okay, and then I know we're running short, but while I'm running through these next slides, um, are there any questions? None here. Okay. I have a question, um, Becky. So this is for a priest, so as a preceptor, when do um, I as a preceptor let like the School of Nursing know that there's a problem student? Um, so when the feedback keeps being given and like the behavior's not changing, like when, when is it appropriate to notify the faculty? Well, safety issues for sure, I would say, talk to your clinical faculty about it. And you just say to the student, you know, this is a safety concern. Um, I, I, this is this is a learning process, but I just want to let your your faculty member know in case they need to change their instructions for other students. So that's the way you can kind of frame frame that when it's a safety issue. When it becomes a repetitive issue for tardiness or lateness, um, I think it's the repetitiveness that leads you to say, I think we have to have a conversation with your clinical faculty um, because I, you haven't been able to change even though we've made a plan. And certainly taking a step back, play out the plan. Once you make a plan with a student, if you say, you know what, we're gonna check back in a week to make sure that this is better, so long as it's not a safety risk, you have a little bit of time to allow that change in the student and allow them to, to play out their plan. But when you meet your deadline in that plan and the, the behavior hasn't changed, then it becomes a time to, to bring it to the clinical faculty. Thanks, that's a great question, Mary. Okay, so the last few slides um, for you, sorry. And then this is a great resource for you. It's an open um, free resource. Um, it is from the UK, but session six is all about assessment and feedback. It's kind of fun to watch some information from another um, another country. Um, and then the references are here at the end.